inside my head. I try to turn it down, but I can't quite drown it out. I'm tortured every Welcome day. and thank you for joining us today. You're listening to Society Bites Radio, and I'm your host, Dr. Richard Himmer. And I'm Sherry Himmer, and this is Authentically You, social interaction for the mind and soul. For the next 25 minutes, we're going to talk about healing and growth from the inside out. Remember, you are 100% responsible for your happiness, joy, and well-being. Cher, in our last segment, we uh, we kind of got into the awareness journal, but we only got halfway through. So perhaps we could do a, a short recap, talk a little bit about what the awareness journal's purpose is, why we're doing it, and then we can review the first two steps and then finish out the, the next two steps. So the awareness journal is sequentially where you begin um, to make changes in your life because you've got to um, start with self-awareness along the ladder of emotional um, intelligence. And the awareness journal is really just four things that you are going through every day. You're noticing something you've learned, your IQ. You're noticing something in your emotional world, your EQ. You advocate something for yourself and note on it. And then you take a notation of gratitude, something for which you're grateful. And those four things are the basis of your awareness journal. So last time we went through the IQ and the EQ, and we gave some great examples. But the interesting thing about the EQ is that you begin with um, noticing things going on around you. So try not to be judgmental of others, but you're just taking data points of what you notice of behaviors emotionally around others. So the actual word wording is do not judge the person, only give a name to the behavior. Yeah, you're just that will naming really help behaviors you. right. you're, you're seeing, not for the sake of judging others, but so that you can become more aware emotionally what's going on. Then the second way you want to observe your emotional intelligence world is um, to observe behaviors in yourself then observe your effect on others by by observing body language and energy and conversations you interact with other people. And I would throw on there, and others' impact upon you. True. You mm -hmm. can j literally just be somewhere, and someone could walk in or say something. This is not unusual for me to hear about someone who says, they just said this word, and boom. I watched it happen in a in an um, appointment two days ago. They were going along really well. I was negotiating um, between two executives and one of the executives said something and unbeknownst to everyone that the other executive flooded right on the spot. And then they both started the escalation process to the point we had to stop and abort the call because it escalated very quick um, or quickly. And neither one of them. So it was <clears> like a singular word was a trigger. For it that seemed person. that way. I don't really know what happened, but they escalated so quickly um, that a couple of days later, they're still working on mending that, that yeah. unfortunate experience. Yeah. So when you're using an awareness journal, you can start to fine tune what are those things that you need to work on. Maybe it is a word that really triggers you. And, and that's what, and what Sherry said here is critical. It's what you need to work on, yeah. not what they need to work on. It really is all about you. And if you focus that way, the probability of healing is high. If you don't, well, it's going to be a lot more challenging. Well, it's not going to be possible. Yeah. So today we're going to look at the other two components of the awareness journal. And those are advocate and gratitude. And it's fun talking about gratitude in the last segment, but we're going to kind of break it down here. So an advocate, what we understand, it's a well understood belief that happiness comes from being in the service of others. So there's this, in my opinion, there's a myth out there that and it comes from a scripture. It says, um, when you find yourself, lose yourself. And what people miss, they only hear is that lose yourself. Then you can find yourself. But you can't find something that you've never had. Or you can't lose something you've never had. So if I have a pen, which I do sitting in my hand, um, if I'm supposed to find my pen, I, I have to have had it at least at one point yeah, in time. Yeah, it has to have been yours to find. Um, and so there's a saying, and I believe it's by Richard Rohr, and I want to get that. So, and yeah, here it is. Um, he writes this, and I'm, I'm going to quote what he has to say about this. It's, it's helped me understand it. Far too many people, and then parenthetically, especially women and disadvantaged people, 
have lived very warped and defeated lives because they've tried to give up a self that was not there yet. Some make a sacrificial and heroic life their whole identity and end up making everyone else around them sacrifice so that they can be sacrificial and heroic. So my take on that from what Mr. Rohr said is that when we, and this is all victim mentality, right. it's playing the role of a victim. The, the, the mother of four who's even working and is exhausted all the time rarely advocates for herself because her statements are cognitive distortions. I have no time. I'm too busy. I can't do that. Well, if I do that, then this will happen. That's cat catastrophizing. It's fortune telling. Um, my kids won't ever, that's mind reading. So what I'm suggesting, and we're going to cover that in, in an upcoming segment, but my suggestion is the reason you take care of yourself is so you can be with your children, is so you can help others. You can't be helping others and then you'll end up dying. The, there's a book out called Give and Take. Great research. Hmm. The people who give and give and give with no boundaries yeah. end up being served because they run out. The people who hold a boundary, learn how to say no, end up being able to give at exponentially more than the people who just give and give and give. So, so it's not about giving. When we talk about advocating for yourself, it's not in, in a mode of selfishness. There's no selfishness yeah, it, at all. It it's, is for the purpose that you can be service-minded. So having said that, yeah. now we can move into the advocate section because it's critical we understand that we rarely take care of ourselves because our identity is that I have no worth or I'm not good enough. So um, I support the idea that, um, that it's important to serve others, but you need to be able to serve yourself first. So uh, what I wrote here was, if happiness and joy are derived from serving others, it's important to have the ability and fortitude to actually be in the service of others. So there are three areas that when practiced will directly impact your ability to be in service of others. And this is what I wanna start with. There's a lot of ways to advocate for yourself. But what I do in the office is I start with the basics, sleep, exercise, and food. Actually, sleep, food, exercise in that order. So let's just talk about sleep for just, just a second. And by the way, until they get the sleep down, I don't go to anywhere else. I just stay on the sleep. Then I'll move to diet and then exercise. Exercise of the three is, is the least important, um, if I understand it right. Because if you're not sleeping well, what good does the exercise do? It compromises you. All right. Most studies agree that the mean average of sleep is about eight and a half. It's 8.6 hours per night. And on average, we as Americans get a lot less than that. There is, however, a direct correlation with the energy, cognitive ability, stress, depression, anxiety. Just listen to all these things. Um, anxiety, obesity, chronic pain, and the amount of sleep one gets the first and most important area to advocate is deliberately practicing getting sound sleep. And that's where the sacred hour comes in. We've, we've co covered that on the. Wait, I think we have talked about sacred hour, but we could do it in just a few minutes that you've got to um, change the environment to, in order to create that habit of sleep. You can't just go from video gaming and having a lot of blue light. You've got to, especially if you're feeling challenged with sleep. If, you, if you're not, some people are just bored sleepers and you can go to bed and hit the pillow and sleep well, but you, anybody's going to enhance that quality of sleep by taking an hour to um, retune themselves right. physically and environmentally for sleep. And that usually means disconnecting from screens and blue light. So wait, what I suggest you do is take one hour before lights out and practice getting yourself ready to go to sleep. If you're using any kind of sleep enhancements other than melatonin, you're not getting the well, deep REM. And even melatonin is not, um, it's still taking away your own brain's ability to, um, to, to, to moderate. Yeah, right. So what I'm suggesting here is if you're taking um, sleep enhancements, you're never going to get to that deep REM position. Yeah. So it's learning how to, to al allow yourself to create an environment where you can get good sleep. So take that hour before, so if lights out are at 10, for mm -hmm. example, because you need to get up at 6, 6.30, um, that means starting at nine o'clock, you go into your sacred hour. And in your sacred hour, you do your basic hygiene. Um, you're gonna do your awareness journal. You're going to, and I suggest a bath, a shower, a hot tub for some, 
dim the lights, turn down the music, get off the blue light completely, um, and then you're going to do a couple of things that are critical. Awareness journal would be wonderful. Sharing your awareness journal. I have some families that will take up to an hour so the kids can do their awareness journals, and the kids actually don't let the parents talk because <laughs> they just want to share what they're learning today and what they did. Um, it's been funny, fun to watch them talk about that. And then if you connect with another member of your family while you're sharing, when you go to bed, you're thinking about ideas, not people. You're not thinking about events. You're thinking about ideas, and that's the highest level of your mind. And then read a book, but don't read um, a romance novel. Read a book that's going to put data into your mind. Um, even some fantasies have great morals to them. As long as it's principle-based, if there's morals to it, there's a high level of of ideas that are going to be found when you sleep is when you learn and you get into what's called a theta brainwave so you start connecting the dots while you're asleep and resting your brain isn't so that's why i'm suggesting that last hour you're setting yourself up for a good night's rest and then right. so you, you kind of qualify don't read romance novels i would say don't read something that isn't going to uplift you. So, you know, drop the Stephen King. It could be any there. Definitely there's literature that's going to stimulate your brain into not a good sleep. Mm -hmm. That's fine. Yeah. yeah, it's that qualifier. So that's the idea. Now, exercise um, and diet, we could we don't need to go into too much detail, but learning how to exercise daily. And I don't mean movement, going to like yeah. some. I don't mean going to the gym movement. and pump yeah. weights. Put yourself in motion, especially if you have depression and if you have anxiety. Going into motion will be the best thing if it's just getting up and walking around. And you have to pre-plan the movement. People who have depression don't pre-plan it. They just go, oh, I'll just get up when I can. Yeah. You just gave yourself a ticket to stay in bed. It's interesting because I'm dealing with somebody at work that is kind of battling um, seasonal affect disorder. That's rough. And, yeah. and having moved from one environment to the Northwest has been challenging for this person. And um, she's aware of her challenge, but she's really pretty frustrated with it. I said, because she looks athletic and trim. I'm like, have you ever done running? She goes, oh, yeah. I used to run seven miles a day at one point in my life. And how did you feel at that time? Oh, I was great. It didn't matter where I lived. I'm like, it's really interesting because she's not being able to afford or find the time or settle her life to the point Advocating. where she can even advocate for herself in terms of physical activity. Right. Yeah, and that's, you know, I, I've got a little bit of that. Yeah, and there, there's stuff. a lot of st studies that show that a high cardio, um, cardio workout right. seven days a week for people with depression is more effective than any kind of medication. And all of this comes down to pre-planning, by the way. Yeah. If you pre-plan, I'm going to start my sacred hour at nine, and it's the most important part of your day, then you're setting yourself up for success. And that habit, as you do it over and over and over again, becomes your habitat. That's what you live in. It then makes the decisions. So if someone says, hey, let's go do X or something, you go, um, as long as I'm home by nine, I can do that. So you're setting yourself up for success instead of the reverse. So you're saying, Dr. Henry, you actually have to challenge or schedule when you're going to have the sacred hour? Maybe even saying, put it on your Google calendar? I'm saying just that. Mm -hmm. um, great writers. People who are really good at writing are in the mood to write at the same time every day. Now, in the mood to write is a little tongue-in-cheek, but they are writing at the same time. I can speak from personal experience. I wrote a dissertation and a book at the same time. I wrote daily. Yeah. When I got out of writing, it's been a bear to get back into the habit. If you look at my calendar now, you'll see that writing, writing is, is 0700 every day. Yeah. And I've been writing voraciously because I'm back in that habit again. And it feels really good. And I bring this up about the schedule because people think, okay, yeah, sleep, sacred hour, whatever. Okay, just make it happen. Well, it's not, it doesn't work that way. Because no. you've, you've let life control you and now you're going to control your life. And, and so when we talk about you're 100% responsible for your happiness, joy, and well-being, it starts with something as simple, innocuous as at 9 o'clock, I turn all my electronics off, I put my phone down, I brush my teeth, I wash my face, I take a shower, I take a bath or a hot tub, um, I go through.